I'm about to talk about Chevron deference. And my Steeler fans' friends think that means there's a line at the gas station like under Jimmy Carter. That's not what it is. But you need to understand Chevron deference and, you under, uh, and to understand why a new court uh, filing in Loper Bright Enterprises versus Raimondo may finally lead to what we need in this country, which is a checking in of the administrative state. It's been filed by the former Solicitor General of the United States, Paul Clement, who joins me now. Uh, General Clement, welcome to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Great to talk to you. It's great to be with you, um, and I'm very uh, happy you know, to talk about the case. You are a friend of Carol platt Lebow, and she's been telling me for years, how can you not know Paul Clement? You know Ruxley, you know Ted Olson, you know Chuck Cooper, and you know uh, Ken Starr. I, said, I just never run across him. He's too young. So am I correct you've argued more than 100 Supreme Court's uh, arguments thus far? That's right, Hugh. I have argued more than 100 cases. Quite amazing to me. That is so fabulous. And I have personally recommended this man to people when they are looking for Supreme Court litigators because you don't want to send in local counsel, actually, to argue before the Supreme Court. This case of Loper Bright, though, caught my eye, Paul Clement, because I teach uh, con law and I try and explain Chevron deference and even law students' eyes glaze over. But it can't be an issue for the administrative conference. It can't be an issue for administrative lawyers and professors. It matters to every small business and American carrying great burdens of regulation. Will you explain what Chevron deference is and then what Loper Bright is going to try and do? I would be delighted to. So the the thing about Chevron, at least, that that makes me so kind of concerned about it is, Hugh, if you and I have a lawsuit and we disagree about the meaning of a statute, um, the court is ultimately going to have to figure out which one of us is right and there's no tiebreaker. They have to do all the work and they have to get to a point where they just give their best impression as to what the statute means. But if instead of having a legal dispute with you, I have a legal dispute with a federal government agency, then instead of the courts having to get the statute just right and figure out what's the best reading of the statute, they essentially get to look at it, and unless the statute is clearly in my favor, then basically the courts will defer to the government. And that's really never made any sense to me. I mean, in a, in a system where we're trying to protect the liberty of the individuals, you would think that the rule is, if the statute's unclear, the tie ought to go to the citizen, not that the tie ought to go to the government. But the rule is Amen. unfortunately the opposite. In 1983-84, and, and we're, we're going to talk about the plaintiffs especially, but I was going to say in 1983-84, when I clerked on the D.C. Circuit, it's before Chevron. And uh, we had different tests. I mean, it was a mess, and no one quite knew what to do with it. But this Chevron deference came in after I stopped actually practicing, other than as an administrative lawyer looking for permits. It's completely changed the way that the government operates, and I don't know that... Do you think the justices understand how absolutely indifferent agencies are to the average person approaching them for help? I think some of the justices do. I think that is really one of the things that the change in personnel on the court over the last couple of years has really made a you know, big difference. Because I do think that you know Justice Kavanaugh saw this firsthand on the D.C. Circuit even though Justice Gorsuch was out in Denver, administrative law was a particular focus of his. So he understands these issues. He understands the stakes. And I think they have an appreciation that the Chevron doctrine is problematic, both from the standpoint of the citizen facing the government in a particular case. But I think they also appreciate that it really kind of erodes the way the separation of powers is supposed to work in our system of government because it makes it frankly too easy for the executive branch to legislate and when you allow the executive branch to legislate it makes it easier for congress not to legislate and to just sit on the sidelines and let the executive branch try to deal with some of the big issues in society and you know, it's, it's hard enough to call your congressperson and get their attention, but try getting a hold of some regulator at the National Marine Fisheries Service or the Environmental Protection Agency or fill in the blank. And 
you know, they're not responsive and they're not responsive for a reason that I think the framers of our Constitution would well understand. Why would they be responsive? They don't have to face the electorate. You know, the genius yeah. of the framers was they put most of the power and all of the power to legislate in the hands of people that were going to face the electorate at least in the House of Representatives, and in the Senate, they were going to be responsive to the states. So the idea that the people who would pass laws that would tell you when you should fish and you know when you can pay for some government monitor to be stuck on your boat, which starts getting to the facts of our case, they assumed that those restrictions on our liberty would only be imposed by people we could pretty immediately vote out of office. You know, it's the closest thing to a Third Amendment case I've ever seen. But I, I, I got to tell you, last night I was trying to explain to my wife, who's been listening to me complain about the Army Corps of Engineers, the EPA, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for 30 years. I'm retired now, so I have no active cases, nothing, no conflict. But for 30 years, she heard me complain. She could not believe the facts that I gave her about Loper Bright. So would you please tell our audience the facts, because no one's going to believe it. I would be delighted to. So... The first fact, which is really bad enough and already is so bad that it did cause me to, to cite the Third Amendment to our Constitution in our reply brief, and I've been at this a long time and I'm not sure I've gotten a chance to cite our Third Amendment before. First time I've but ever it, seen it. <laughs> the, 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 the law itself does give the federal government the ability to force fishing vessels to essentially have a monitor who's a federal government's eyes and ears um, on their boat. And it, like, it is an incredible imposition when you understand that we're not talking about massive commercial boats with enough space for 20 or 30 fishermen. We're talking about relatively small fishing vessels that have enough room for five, six, seven, eight people. And the idea that one of those five, six, seven, eight people is gonna be a government agent who's not gonna do any fishing themselves and is just gonna be there making sure that you're not taking too much of one kind of fish or another, that's bad enough. But that's not really what the case is about. What the case is really about is that without any authority from Congress, the agency has said, not only do you have to have this monitor on board, but you have to pay their salary. You have to, you have to foot the bill for having somebody whose full-time job is to take space on your boat and to make sure you're obeying the law. Up to 20% of your catch, right? Up to 20% of your profits, you have to pay the government. Absolutely, you have to pay for this monitor and there are one or two places where the law does require a contribution from the vessel owner to pay for the monitor, but it's only for one or two situations. It's only with respect to larger commercial fisheries who can essentially afford it. But here's the kicker. The one or two places that Congress has authorized it, they limit the amount of the imposition to 2 or 3%. So here the agency gives itself the power, but then it doesn't put really any limit on it. And here it can be up to 20% of their profits go poof. Yeah, you know, and, uh, General Clement, when I read the, the D.C. Circuit's opinion, which is a 2-1 opinion, I read that after I read your petition for cert before I wrote my Washington Post column, they seem to treat the Supreme Court new precedent on administrative law the way that the National Marine Fisheries Service treated the comment. It was like a Potemkin Village notice and comment here. 90% of the notice and comment responses said, don't do this, you'll kill us. And the National Marine Fisheries Service just dismissed them. Well, the DC Circuit took a look at what the Supreme Court's been saying about administrative law. And they said, we are fully aware of that, but this isn't that. And I said, oh my gosh, this is exactly that. I mean, isn't that your reaction? This is exactly what the major questions doctrine or other changes, maybe they just need a two by four to get it right. Well, sometimes the court has to give an unmistakable message to the courts of appeals before they'll listen. You know, I had a case last term 
completely different area of the law. But for years and years and years, the Supreme Court had basically been saying we've moved away from our lemon test in the free, in the in the establishment clause context. And last term, the court got frustrated with lower courts not getting the message and just made it unmistakably clear in the case involving Coach Kennedy. And I think we may need something else in the administrative law area. Let, let's the, go there, because I think you're right. I, 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 I got 30 years of experience with Rapanos. All right, uh, Rapanos isn't 30 years old, but I did ACOE permitting for all those years. Rapanos comes down, and you don't have to know that, America, what it means, but it's clear direction to the Army Corps of Engineers that they're doing it wrong, and the Army Corps of Engineers proceeded to read Rapanos, Anthony Kennedy's opinion, and say, let's just continue doing what we want to do. It's, it's like this vast kudzu of agencies that don't care about every effort to check them, Paul Clement. What do you want the court, if you could write the opinion for them, what would they say as a rule to replace Chevron? Well, I would say, personally, the first step is you overrule Chevron, make it unmistakable, and then you just essentially force everybody to do their job. I mean, the courts just have to interpret the statutes. They can't put a thumb on the scale in favor of the government. If they're going to put a thumb on the scale anywhere, it should be on the side of the citizen. But they should just do their job. They should figure out what the statute means. They shouldn't defer to the agency in the process. And then I think the net effect of that will be to have the executive branch do less and have Congress essentially be forced to do more. And I'm sure many of your listeners don't think you know, Congress doing more sounds like necessarily a great idea. I suppose it depends on the Congress. But I do think our system of government is set up that the only people that should be legislating in Washington, D.C. ought to be the Congress. It shouldn't be people in the executive branch that nobody can get a hold of, nobody can complain, they aren't accountable to the electorate. And, and Hugh, I'll tell you what really attracted to me to this case you know, I've, I've had other cases where I've tried to cut back on Chevron, but I've been arguing for, you know, on behalf of, you know, major oil companies, major chemical companies. But this case, more than, than most, really kind of puts it on the level of the individual citizen. And it kind of puts Chevron in context to what it means to a small business person. That's and why I love it. Is, and... and Anyone who saw the movie Coda, they saw a federal monitor on a fishing boat screwing up the fishing boat, and it's a small business that's barely making ends meet. And I found that in my life. Big development, big landowners can deal with the agencies because they can hire me and people like me at ridiculous amounts to deal with a seven-year entitlement. Little landowners get crushed by the EPA. Uh, the, the Chevron deference actually puts the largest burden on the smallest clients. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And sophisticated clients know how to lobby agencies. When they get with the agency, they're not ignored the way that 90% of the commentators here were. Um, and so I do think that Chevron, you know, it seems like, I mean, just the name of the case, you know, you just think big companies, you know, being regulated by the federal government. Hard to know who to root for, but in a case like this, where you know you see the the you know the these these vessels are really they are classic small businesses, they are being regulated some of them virtually out of existence by these burdens, and so this is just really important. I really hope the court will take it, as you know, you getting the Supreme Court to take any one case is about the hardest thing to do in Washington. But I do think that, you know, we have, we have some great support from Amiki, you know, friends of the court, but they are urging the court to take this case. We have, we have something like 10 amicus briefs in support of this. We have people like you writing columns, highlighting the case, and I thank you for that. I mean, so I think we have a lot going for us, but I really hope the court will take this case. Well, let me raise the objection that came up in response to the column I wrote in the Washington Post. 1,600 people got angry at me and put nasty comments down. They said, oh, wow, well-timed. The bank just collapsed for lack of regulation, and the train just derailed for lack of regulation. And I don't get mad at people. They don't understand. That's got nothing to do with regulatory failure. That's got a lot to do with regulatory capture. And 
I mean, do you think you're going to run into that argument from our friends on the maybe center left side of the of the court? Your old you know, Justice Kagan was Solicitor General Kagan first. Is she going to say, oh, my gosh, you're proposing an unregulated world, Paul Clement? I don't think so. I mean, I, I, look, I'm not I'm not saying that if this case gets up there, I will have every justice with me. But I think somebody like Justice Kagan, who has seen the full scope, the way, you, you know, I would obviously had the same job as she did. And when you have a job like that, you see all of the regulatory uh, output of the federal government. And you realize that all these regulations are not committed equal. There are some areas where the regulations work. There are other areas where, as you say, the real problem is regulatory capture, um, not overregulation. But then there are some areas where it's just the regulatory agencies are unchecked. And, of course, we talked about this already, but where would you expect to see that? Would you expect to see Citibank overregulated? No. You'd expect to see people like these small fishing vessels and their operations overregulated because they just don't have the forces to fight back. And again, going back to just like the genius of the framers, you know, they expected small businesses to mostly be regulated by the states and local governments where a small business still might have a foothold in the community, ability to get the ears of legislatures, get sympathy from other people in the community who the, the legislatures had to be respectful for. But when you have the federal government directly regulating small businesses, it's just not a fair fight. And well, now, General Clement, I can just hear Justice Brown Jackson or Justice Sotomayor saying, so you're saying that we should just dismantle the federal administrative process with that, that we're just going to turn these people loose. I know you're not saying that, but you're going to need a, a different rule to come up with, right? You, we are going to need a different rule. And the different rule in this context, though, I think is the rule that applies in almost every other area of the law, as, as we said at the outset. If you and I get in a lawsuit and the lawsuit turns in the meaning of the statute, the court decides the meaning of the statute. One of us is right. One of us is wrong. But one of us doesn't leave court with the court telling us, well, you know, it was close and we actually think the statute's unclear and we're just going to go with the government because they're the government. I mean, that just doesn't I, I, I don't think that passes the basic fairness test. So I don't think, you know, this may not be the case. There are going to be other cases down the line, right, where the court wrestles with whether we can really even have some of these so-called independent agencies that aren't directly accountable to the president and end up being accountable to no one. And in those cases, it may be fair, it may be fair to ask, well, what's that going to mean for regulation? But, but here, I think, in some respect, it's easier because what's going to happen if the court moves away from Chevron is that courts will have to do their job, agencies will have to do their jobs, and that will, I think, the combined effect of that will force Congress to do its job. Well, even if they say silence is an ambiguity, I, I mean, or this is almost ambiguous, it was such a strange DC Circuit opinion, I thought this is a wide open door for every petty tyrant in the 2.8 million strong civilian federal employment workforce, and I know that there are a lot of good people trying to do good work, but there's a bell curve in everything. So last question, Paul Clement, how do we get notice and comment rulemaking back to what the APA godfathers thought it would be, a genuinely deliberative process where data mattered? Because I have seen it as a general counsel myself of a federal agency right through to when I laid down the, the lists and, and got out of the law, they don't care what you send in. They pretend to read it. They pretend to answer it. And then they do what they would have done 60, 90 days, whatever. And we see that all the time, depending on who's in charge of the agency. How do we fix that? Because it's, it's a Potemkin village uh, notice and comment process. I agree. And I think that has to be fixed through rigorous enforcement of the APA and kind of meaningful review. But I really do think this case could be a step in the right direction. 
And just one last thought on this case and why it's so important. I, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a realistic person. I've lived in Washington a long time now, and I always feel like, you know, there are things that the court can do, but one of the other protections we have against overregulation is just, you know, at, at some point, if an agency puts so many regulations on the books, they can't even pay enough people to enforce them. And that's why I find this case so important and so pernicious, because if the executive branch can essentially fund its own monitors, doesn't need appropriations from Congress, it can just say, look, you, you know, you the regulated, you the citizens, you have to pay essentially for additional government officials and agents to enforce our laws, then there's almost no practical limit to how many- Well, that, that got my attention. I began to think about uh, in the regulatory context I'm familiar with, what if I have to pay for a monitor from the Army Corps of Engineers to be on the site for every day of the site construction and I have to pay for it, my developer client has to pay for it, and there is, they can't do that. Or if you're an OSHA regulated person and OSHA says you're gonna have an OSHA inspector there 24 seven and you're gonna pay for it, that is an unlimited taxing authority. It can't be constitutional. It really can't. Because the one thing the framers were absolutely clear about is the power of purse, the power of the purse has to be with Congress and particularly has to start in the House of Representatives, the most representative branch of government. So I do think the framers would be particularly offended by this particular form of regulation where the regulators are essentially appropriating their own funds um, and spending it to essentially get additional federal agents monitoring every one of us. I, I hope everyone reads your, uh, your petition for cert in the reply as well. Let me just get closed by asking you, when do you expect to hear from the court? Obviously, it hadn't been even scheduled for a conference yet, I don't think. But when, when would you expect to hear? And then the argument would be next fall, right? The argument would be next fall. We would expect to hear within the next month. Um, so it is now fully briefed and it's being distributed to the justices. So I think we're three or four weeks away. Um, and there are obviously some vagaries of timing there and the court can um, hold the case and relist it, which it usually does before it grants. So we'll be looking for hopefully some good news in about a month. Well, you've got three alumni of the DC circuit out of the nine. I think they would be, I mean, Brett Kavanaugh has been waiting for this case for years, I would assume. Uh, good luck in that. And uh, General Clement, thank you for joining me and talking about this case. I hope you'll keep coming back when we get one this big, this important. And people don't even know about it because it's, it's, it's fishing boats, right? They don't get it. But you're doing your best to raise its profile. And I appreciate that you did it with me. No, my pleasure. Good to be with you. Thank you. And to America, we're going to make sure all of uh, General Clement's audio is posted over at the uh, Hugh, highly concentrated Hugh podcast today so people can listen to, learn, and understand it's about you, all right? That's the real deal. This case is about you. No matter where you are regulated or how much you are regulated or how much it costs, it's about you. And the Supreme Court has to slap back the administrative state. It has to, it's out of control. Uh, good luck, Godspeed, General Clement. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Generalissimo. Go hear the whole Paul Clement conversation at Highly Concentrated Hugh. My conversation with Ro Khanna is already transcribed and posted at HughHewitt.com. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I'll be back tomorrow on the next Hugh Hewitt Show.